That's the title of the sermon, Tough Love. So I think that's a good day to talk about love, don't you? Amen. Yeah. Right. So we're going to talk about love today. Um, and I'm inviting you to please bow your hands for the prayer. Father, I want to thank you for all your blessings. Thank you for allowing us to be here in your temple, Father. We need you, God. We need you. We need you, Lord. We can't do anything without you. So please, send your Holy Spirit to be upon each one of us here today to open our minds that we may understand your words. Father, we love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Tough love. Love is a very, very popular word. People use it all the time for anything. L'amour est un mot qui est très populaire. Nous l'utilisons toute la journée. They talk about love all the time in the movies. Most of the songs that we hear on the radio talk about love. And the churches, they, they talk about love all the time. But one day I was reading my Bible. Um, I was reading the, the entire Bible. And uh, when I got to 1 John 3 and 1 John 4, I saw the description that God gave us of love. And uh, I found that this description was mind-blowing. I look at the verses and I said to myself, I don't love like that. That's not even how they taught me to love in the church. And that bothered me. So today I'm going to share what I learned from this text with you. And together we're going to study the topic of love. Because I found that the love that God talked about in these verses was tough. That's why I titled this sermon, Tough Love. Which is not really a sermon, it's more of a teaching uh, moment. Donc, pendant que vous avez dit, 1 Jean 3 et 1 Jean 4, moi, vous voyez comment bon Dieu définit l'amour. Et me dit, bah, ça a dû. C'est pas comme ça qu'on montre l'amour dans l'église. Ce n'est pas comme ça qu'on montre l'amour dans la télévision. Et maintenant, je voulais partager ce que je vais avec nous. Donc, nous allons lire ensemble. Nous allons lire dans 1 Jean 3. Et nous allons commencer à partir du verset 10. 1 Jean 3, verset 10. Let's go to the first slide. We're going to read from the King James Version, and we're going to start with 1 John 3, verse 10 to 12. In this, the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever, though not righteousness, is not of God, neither he that love not his brother. For this is the message that he heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain was of that wicked one and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him. Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. So the first question that we have here, what are the two characteristics that show that, that someone is not 
a child of God. Two characteristics that show that somebody is not a child of God. Um, what? What are those two characteristics? Un monde qui ne peut pas pratiquer la justice et un monde qui ne peut pas aimer. Somebody does not love and somebody who does not perform righteous works. So, so that's how the text starts. Telling us about how we can differentiate between somebody who is a child of God and somebody who is a child of the devil. When we talk about righteousness, we are talking about doing the what? Doing the right thing. How do we know what the right thing is? How do we know? The word of God. The word of God, especially the Ten Commandments. Comment nous connaissons qui ça, qui est bon et ça qui pas bon? Eh bien, c'est dans 10 commandements. C'est là où Dieu dit ça pour faire et ça pour pas faire. So, if you are not keeping the law of God, you are not a righteous person. And the second characteristic is, is if you do not love. We're not going to spend too much time on the law today. We're going to focus mostly on love, but we cannot talk about love without talking about the law. So I mentioned it a few times during our presentation. As a matter of fact, when you read the example that John gave, he talks about Cain. He said, Cain didn't love his brother Abel. You remember the story of Cain and Abel? Yes. yes. Okay, so Cain killed Abel. So because Cain didn't love Abel, he killed him. He violated the Ten Commandments. Because when Cain didn't love Abel, he killed Abel. That means that he violated the Ten Commandments. So they both work together. When you don't love people, you tend to offend them. You tend to violate the Ten Commandments. Mm. If you love somebody, would you steal from that person? No. No, so you won't violate the Ten Commandments. If you love somebody, would you lie to that person? Mm. Our young people fall all the time for this trap. You are with somebody. The person is beating you up, and after that, telling you that the person is lying to you, but after that, telling you that when you love somebody, you don't want to hurt that person. You don't want to offend. The, the, we don't want to transgress the ten commandments. They work together. So let's go to the next question, which is um, that we find in, in, in verse um, 13 and 14. Let's read this text. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abide in death. So the first, second question says, does the world love righteous people? Unfortunately, the world doesn't love people who are doing the right thing. You'll find some people who love people doing the right thing, but most of the people of the world don't love people who are doing the right thing. <coughs> Look at Jesus. Why did they kill Jesus? Because he was doing the right thing. I mean, Jesus was spent three years and a half. What did he do? Heal people. And they killed him. For three years and a half, he helped others. Yet they 
killed him. And even today, 2,000 years later, he's, he's still the most hated person in the world. We have in some country, they are killing people for the name of Jesus. In other countries, they make fun of them. So many movies, so many comedians, when they are doing their stand-up stuff, they mock Jesus. And yet there's nothing wrong you can reproach Jesus. So we gotta be ready. When we are loving, we must know that we should not expect love back all the time. Not because you love somebody, that doesn't mean that person will love you back. Not because you love other people, don't expect that everybody else will love you. That's the reality of life. But you still have to love. Yes. You still have to love. That's why I'm saying tough love. We're talking about tough love today. Look, même si mon ba aimo pa aimer quand même. Amen. Lo aimer n'est pas tout pour ta prier mon. Que des mon va prier mais pas prier mon. Faut apprendre aimer yo quand même. Oh. Question number 3. What does the Bible call somebody who hates another person? Verse 15. Whosoever hated his brother is a murderer. And ye you know not that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. When you hate somebody, God calls you a murderer. Doesn't call you a hater. That's for Facebook. God called you a murderer. I was at work one day and I was talking to one of my coworkers and she was telling me about all the bad things that she's going through, the family members giving her trouble and stuff like that. And I'm like, you know, it seems like you really hate your family members. And she said to me, oh, no, I, I, don't, I don't hate nobody. I just wish bad things happened to them. So I was talking to my co-worker, and my co-worker said, I'm a good guy that my mom and family have done. And I asked her, I'm a good guy, I'm a good guy, I'm a good guy. I'm a good guy, I'm a good guy, I'm a good guy. And I'm a good guy, I'm a good guy. So we have all these, we know that the word, the, 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 say, hate it, the, the hate word is, is a bad word. So we, we, we never want to admit that we hate other people. So we change, we play with the words. We change them. I can't stand you, I can't stand this person. We never say I, I hate this person, I can't stand it. You know? So we play like that. But the feeling is still the same. And in the eyes of God, you are. Murder. And you can be in the church every single day if you have hatred in your heart. God calls you a murder. Question number four. Let's complete this sentence. If you are playing in Hebrew, I hope that you are taking notes. Verse six. First John three verse sixteen. This is what it says. Let's read it together. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the we ought to lay down our lives for the bread. Do, do you understand what God is asking you to do? It's 
telling you, if you say to somebody, I love you, what that really means is that I'm ready to die for you. I am ready to die for you. I'm ready to take a bullet for you. When I read this text, I was wondering whether I was crazy or <laughs> what was John drinking when he wrote this text. Are you ready to take a bullet for somebody? And yet, you are so quick to say, I love you. You are so quick to say, I love you. Are you ready to put your life on the line for somebody? You see, love equals sacrifice. There are four things I'm going to tell you about love that I get from this text. And that's the first thing. Love equals sacrifice. You are not ready to make sacrifices. You are not ready to love. Husband has to make sacrifices for his wife. Wife has to make sacrifices for her husband. Parents make sacrifices for their children. Love for sacrifice. Next question. Verse 17. But whoso had this world's good and seen his brother have need and shut up him and shut up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in the word, neither in tongue, but Indeed and in truth. How should we love? That's our next question. In deed and in truth. The second thing I want you to learn is that love equals action. Love equals action. Love c'est action. C'est pas parler seulement. Faut courage. When you see your brother. In need, you have to help the brother if you truly love the person. You have to help the sister. If you don't, then you don't really love. Verse 6. Um, that's uh, question number 6. And we're going to go to First John chapter 4 now. First John chapter 4. Start with verse 7 to 9. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us. Because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. So we are completing the sentence. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. And every that live, that love is born of God and knoweth God. So this love that we are talking about is not something that we can have in our hearts. It's not something that we can manufacture. It's something that has come from God. Amen. That's why it says, if you truly know God, then you will show love. If you don't show love, that means you don't know God. Simple man. Question 7. How do we know that God loves us? Chapter 12, verse 10. Herein is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son.
to be the appropriation for our sins. So God made a sacrifice to show us that he loved us. He made a sacrifice. He provided for our need because we were in need of salvation. So God saw our needs and provided for it. He acted upon it. That's how he showed us that he loved us. And not only he gave his son, but he promised us eternal life. He promised us that one day the trials and tribulations that we are facing here on earth will come to an end. I hope that you would say amen to that. Amen. Your trials and tribulations here on earth one day will come to an end. Amen. No more worries about the bills. No more worries about the, the, the sickness. No more worries about death. All these will come to pass because God loves us. Amen. Some people think that God takes pleasure in our suffering. Some people think that when God is right there in heaven looking at us fighting, killing each other, seeing the little children suffering in sickness, that God is having a good time. No, he does not. And when we read the Bible, we can see that. God doesn't want us to suffer. Even those who are doing bad things, he wants to save them. That's why he's so patient with them, even when they are doing bad things. Even when they are hurting other people, God is giving them one more day to change, to repent. Because he loves them. Unfortunately, most people would accept it. But if you are here, that's because you want to have a relationship with God. If you are here, that's because you want to understand the God that created you, that made you, that put you on this planet. That's why you are here. That's why you read your Bible. Ou lis la Bible parce que vous voulez connaître mon Dieu, vous voulez comprendre comment mon Dieu y est. Vous voulez bon relation avec mon Dieu. Parce que nous un jour bien pour vivre ensemble avec lui. On joue bien pour vivre ensemble avec lui. On va continuer. Verset 11 à 15, verse 11 to 15. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man had seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us. And, and his love is perfected in us. Remember this word, perfected. Perfection. Remember this word. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he had given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God dwelleth in him and he in God. So why should we love one another? Why should we love one another? Because God loves us. I want you to remember that because God loves us and He made the sacrifice for us before we started loving Him. God loves us first. So our job is to love other people 
first. We're not going to love people because they did something good to us, because they showed love to us, because they showed interest in us, but we need to start loving people even prior to that. He wants us to love just like he loved. Verse 16 said this, And we have known and believed the love that God had to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. He that dwelleth in God dwelleth in uh, He that dwelleth in love Dwell in God. If you see who is in love, si you are born in love, eh bien, you are born in the bon Dieu. So, from reading these texts, we can see that there are two. Twice, John repeat the sentence. One sentence in verse uh, four and in verse sixteen. What's the sentence that John repeated twice? God is love. God is love. Deux fois dans le passage ça. God, hey, John, John, John repeated that ça. Bon Dieu c'est love. God is love. That's a special emphasis uh, that, uh, that John is talking about. So uh, let's continue to verse uh, 20. Are you with us? Is anybody lost? No. All right. Verse 17 to 20. Herein is our love made perfect. Remember this with perfect again. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear hath torment, he that feared is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hated his brother, he is a liar. For he that loved not his brother, whom he had seen, how can he love God whom he had not seen? The third thing I want you to learn from love, I said the first one was love is sacrifice, love is action, love is a principle. Love is a principle. Oftentimes we say love is a feeling. That's how the world sees love, as a feeling, you know? Um, I like this girl, she makes me feel good, so I love her. <laughs> this man made me feel good, I love her. When I'm talking to her, you know, she makes me feel good. Love is a feeling. But the feeling is a problem, because feeling is something that, that goes up and down. Right? Feeling it's like the stock market. One day is up, one day is down. You know, you wake up this morning, you know, you had a good night of sleep, had a good breakfast, went to work, you know. You love everybody. You know, kissing, hugging, and all that stuff. Kiss your husband, kiss your wife, your kids, and all that You have a good day. The sun is shining. You having a good day. And the boss calls you, and yell at you in front of everybody. <laughs> now you are feeling that. You come home, you are yelling at everybody. Everybody has to stay three feet away from you to talk to you. <coughs> that's how love, that's, that, that's, that's feeling. But principle is something that doesn't change. It's something that doesn't fluctuate. It's something that stays constant. So, when you say you love somebody, you just love the person. It doesn't change. Whatever, it doesn't matter what the person do to you, you 
Still love it. And this is where things start to become really, 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 really dangerous. This is where things really, really, really become hard. Because you are talking, you can be talking to somebody in your church and everything is fine, you are laughing together and then five minutes later the person is walking by and step on your foot. Did that say, excuse me? And for the whole week, you're calling everybody at church saying, so and so step on my foot. My turn is on the portion. I'm going to make a lot of Get the memo could shake. Not get all by my God, woman. Not by my superb man. Have you remember what I said? I'm not born with you. We are so sensitive. Anything become a big deal. And we go home, we can't sleep. Because you are, we are thinking about the bad thing that happened. And sometimes the person doesn't even realize that he or she did a bad thing to you. Love is a principle. Doesn't change, doesn't vary. This is why God commands us to love. That's what does God command us? It's Verse 21 says, And this commandment have we from him, that we that he who love God love his brother also. There's no condition here. He just said we have to love. Period. Let's read our last verse, the last text, and we'll be done. Matthew 5. How does God want us to treat those who don't like us? Yeah. Let's go. Verse 44. We're going to read from verse 44 to 48. Yeah, I've heard that. Are you there? Matthew 5. 44 to 48. The last text. Yeah, I've heard that he had been said. Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thy enemies. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good. And send it rain on the just and on the unjust. For if we, if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same. And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is. So the text says, love your So when somebody curses you, what, to, what do you do? Curse them back? No. What do you do? Bless them. If somebody hates you, what do you do? Bless them. You do good to them. And if somebody is using you, abusing you, persecuting you, what do you do? That's the that's how God wants us to act. You see, I've heard so many preachers preaching the wrong thing. Actually, a few years ago, a preacher came here and said that when somebody is bothering him, 
he read the name of that person on a piece of paper, put it on the floor, and step on it, step on it, step on it. If you have a bad problem, 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 you have a bad I curse anybody who says some bad things about my ministry. If somebody says bad things about, about my ministry, I'm cursing you, I'm placing a curse on you. This is a message out there. And people love this message. People love it. When the preacher says, I'm going to pray for something bad to happen to anybody who's bothering you. People raise their hands, they come all together. Yes, we're going to curse the person. That's not the Bible truth. I remember one day, um, I, I was at a job. And I had a co-worker who was giving trouble. Trouble, trouble, trouble. Everybody at the job hit it because of all the trouble she was causing. And I went home every day. I felt so bad for the person that every day and night I went home, I prayed for the person. I asked God to bless the person and to change the person. Every night I pray for this person. And you know what? The person didn't change. Actually, actually the person got worse. Now she started attacking me personally. And I went home and prayed. Every night. One day something happened and I was really, really mad. It's really pissed off, so I didn't say anything, but I said, this is it. I went home, I prayed. And I went to the person and I said to the person, you know, the way that you're acting is You can't be on the job and be so toxic to everybody. Mm. And I talked to her, I talked to her. I never mentioned what the person, what she did to me. Never. And I told her that I want, I, I want to change. When God say that we need to pray for people to change, we need to do a censor if I have a heart. Amen. And God will act on the person's heart. That doesn't mean that the person will change. I want you to know that. Because God doesn't force anybody God will touch your heart. God will melt your heart. But God cannot change a person who doesn't want to be changed. When I talked to the person, the person recognized the one that she was doing. But there was no change. There was no repentance. Four days later, she got called and got fired. You see, I learned from that that I don't have to worry about my enemies. When God says that He will take care of them, He will take care of them. I don't have to ask for bad things, I have to ask for good things. But if the person doesn't want to change, guess what? God will do what needs to be done. 
Because God will deliver his children. Yes. Amen. So that's why whenever I hear bad things about me, when I hear bad things about my wife, about my family, <coughs> I'm not worried. Amen. You're not getting in trouble with me. You're getting in trouble with God. I have to pray for you, ask for mercy for you. I pray that you change. But if you don't, I'm going to be in trouble with me, I'm in trouble with God. So this is the last thing I want you to learn about love. The last thing is that love is perfection. Love is perfection. You see, verse 48 says, Be ye perfect, therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. You saw when we are reading 1 John 4, we saw the word perfect many times. You see, perfection is not, I keep all the commandments, I come to church every Saturday, um, I respect everything, I don't eat this, I don't eat that. That's not perfection. Perfection is when you can love your enemies. Jesus, while they were crucifying Jesus, Jesus was on the cross, being mocked, being beaten, being spit on, and yet he was showing love to those who are hurting him. That's perfection. Stephen. They stoned Stephen. While they were stoning Stephen, Stephen was showing love to those who were killing him. This is perfection. This is perfection when you can love those who don't like you, those who hate you, those who are trying to hurt you, those who are saying bad things about you. This is perfection. So, I hope that you will take these words and you will meditate on these verses. And if there is anybody that you are holding grudge against, I'm inviting you to release. I'm inviting you to release. I'm inviting you to forgive and to love. Whether you hate a brother or sister in the church, whether you hate a neighbor, or call it something else like I can stand or other thing, whether you hate a family member, I want you to release it. So I'm inviting you right now, if that's, that's your desire, to ask God to give you the same love that Jesus Christ has for you and for me. I ask you to stand as we pray. If that is your desire, I know it's not easy. I know it's not easy. I know it's not easy for me. I'm being challenged all the time. And guess what? You're going to be challenged. Lots <laughs> But you have to commit to God and ask God, I don't want to let people hurt me. And even if they do, I still want to practice the love that you want me to practice. So we're going to try, we're going to fight. 
to love like God loved us. We cannot fight to love like God loves us. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for all. I thank you for your blessings. I thank you for caring for us and for watching us, Lord. I thank you for loving me so much. Because I know that I'm good. I'm not good. I know that I'm a failure. I know that I don't love the way that you want me to love. I know that I don't love my wife the way that you want me to love her. I know that I don't love my brothers and sisters in the church the way that you want me to love them. I know that I don't love my coworkers the way that, I, that you want me to love them. So I ask for forgiveness. And I want to be there. Lord, I'm saying I because not, I'm not just talking about myself. But I'm talking also about each and every member of this church here. Because we are failing. We all are failing. We say the words, I love you, all the time. But deep in our hearts, we are far from practicing it. So, Father, forgive us. And help us to release anybody that we are holding in our hearts. Help us to let go. Help us to bless and not to curse. Help us to pray and not to hurt. Father, we need you. Be with us, Father. Strengthen us. By the force of courage, we support it in prayer. Amen. And when we have to turn to the Lord, we have to turn to the Lord. We have to turn to Si comme on a attaqué nous en dans l'église, on a demandé de bénir nous. Si comme on a attaqué nous en foyer, on a demandé de bénir nous. Si comme on a attaqué nous en travail, on a demandé de bénir nous. Que mon Seigneur est capable de changer. Que par des petits tout Seigneur. Et là nous vivons dans ciel là, Seigneur, ni nous-mêmes, n'a pas qu'aimer mais ensemble avec eux pour chanter. Les alléluia sans fils. Nous ne pouvons pas faire un ennemi en Seigneur. Tout le monde sait bien moi. No more enemies, Lord. No more haters, Lord. Just brothers and sisters. In Jesus' name.